All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live with episode number seven of Change Makers. We've got a special guest today, Seth Rotberg. Seth is a patient advocate, motivational speaker. We're going to have a great time with him. I'll introduce him in just, just a minute as we get started. This is our second episode of the week. So we're doing a two times Change Makers this evening. So start sharing this page out. This is going to be a great conversation. Uh, not having anything to do with politics tonight. This is going to be about people that are creating change in their communities, in their own lives, in the world around them, inspiring others to do the same. This is a great opportunity for you to share something on the Be The Change page that is creating positivity, sharing positivity, and allowing you guys to be the change you wish to see in the world. So we will get started in about 30 seconds. So if you could share this out there, episode number seven of Change Makers with Seth Rotberg, this is going to be great. Tell us where you're from in the comment box. Gina's already here. Hello from Virginia. Everybody, go ahead and start making comments. Hearts on the page, likes, etc. And keep on sharing. We'll begin in just about 30 seconds. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? This is Anthony Russo from hashtag Be The Change. We're seeing a lot of people come in the comment box. Who oh, yeah, Lisa. We, of course, have the Tolis Runner. Hello, Maria from Massachusetts. Jerry Peacock, North Carolina. Chris Hubbard from the best state on earth. Tejas, I'm assuming, I believe, from what I remember, and I know where I think we're close to each other. Kristen Nunley, Nikki, of course, Gina. <laughs> what's going on? All right, ladies and gents, we're going to get this show started nice and quick. I hope everybody's having a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome to Hump Day. This is going to be Getting Over the Hump Wednesday edition because uh, we're going to have a great guest. We're going to have a great show. I'm going to remind everybody of everything going on in the world of Be The Change. I'm going to encourage you guys real quick. Help us out by sharing this. If you haven't noticed, we have less viewers than usual. Uh, I don't know why that is, but I can guess. And I think a lot of you guys can as well. I believe as though Cash was just having a video where he was having the exact same problem. He had like 200 people on when he typically would have something like 1,400, 1,500, 2,500. So help us out, share this. This is going to be great positive content. You don't have to be worried about a family member getting offended by anything of this. This is inspirational. This is fun. This is therapeutic on this one. It will be probably for me as well as Seth. Um, cathartic even. So go ahead and share this out there. Help us out. And again, tell you a little bit what we got going on. Um, this is one of our podcast shows. So if you'd like to listen to any of these later, uh, any of the change makers as well as truth will set you free, which we might, I said last night. So getting internet working in the old RV. That's right. Anthony's in the RV right now, the new office. Uh, so hopefully we will, uh, we'll be doing some kind of truth will set you free this evening. We'll be doing a Wednesday edition. Somebody asked me, does truth still happen on Wednesdays instead of truth Tuesdays? The answer is truth always happens if you choose to. All right, so this is where you find the podcast. Go ahead and follow us on there. That would be fantastic. Our Be The Change page as well on YouTube is right here. And as we always say, next week, uh, this is this is when we're going to get some stuff going on with Patreon. We did a, a meeting last month, a meet and greet with me, and getting to learn a little bit more. This time, I've found a bunch of stuff in the storage containers with uh, some of the gear that we had last winter. We've got sweaters, hats, etc. I'm going to be doing trivia with those that are our Patre Patreon. So if you want to join our Patreon as low as $5, it's patreon.com backslash be the change USA. That's how we pay for anything that I've been doing and all the sleepless nights, etc. would love any help that you guys can have. I'm going to keep that up to throughout the show. Uh, lastly, of course, we have our merchandise. We have this now in red, this be the change long sleeve hoodie. Uh, go to hashtag be the change.com. Click it shop at the top of the page. And we did find those winter hats. So we've got about three weeks before those hit the store. So again, that's hashtag be the change uh, and go to shop. Last time again, hit the like button. Tell us where you're from. I'm going to say hi to who do we got? Chris, Christina Boyle, Rhonda Smith shared. Thank you very much. Scott from Ohio, Maryland cricket Whipple. Always love your name, North Carolina. 
Uh, who else we got? Carolyn. Carolyn's from the East Coast. We do have our guest from the East Coast today. Rhonda likes the RV. Lisa Hayes has shared. Thank you very much, Lisa. Appreciate it. You guys rock. All right. Uh, we're ready. This is actually going to be an interesting episode. Um, I think some of you guys have heard me speak before a little bit about my father who had uh, multiple sclerosis. And there. so I have ties to some conditions like this. And one of my final, my dad's final uh, relationships, girlfriends, had a disease called Huntington's Korea. And we're going to learn a little bit more that on about that on this episode. We've got a phenomenal guest that I've, that I've got to speak to a few times. He's inspiring. He's just a really all around great guy. And he's going to inspire you guys a little bit about the moments that we live in life. We had Maggie last night that we had the never give up attitude. And this is going to be following that same kind of message. So uh, Seth is a patient advocate, motivational speaker, uh, passionate about bringing what he has, what he wants to give to the world out there. And he's been a TEDx speaker as well. And his passion is driven by his mother's 17 year struggle with a condition disease called Huntington's Korea. He learned about hunting or he learned about the ability to overcome and look through these kind of situations with that, with seeing her Huntington's disease. And we'll learn more about that if you don't know what that is. Um, but ultimately he's been able to speak to, to thousands and motivate thousands and just be a phenomenal beacon of hope and light. And he's got a great story himself. So ladies and gentlemen, Seth Rotberg. Hello, hello. I was wait, waiting for like the crowd, like give high fives, like I'm coming out of the sporting, you know, a sports game. Um, Let's get ready to rumble. Exactly, exactly. Well, th thanks for having me here. Excited to be a guest on this show, especially something that's near and dear to my heart, which is how to bring positive change to society. Yeah. And we'll share some of your links uh, throughout as well. Uh, the, the, your TEDx speech is, is fantastic. Um, so let's get started. First off, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go into your mother and, and, and the life that you've led kind of since then. Sure thing. So it's, it's an interesting journey I, I took and it's actually a, a very common one in the rare disease space where my mom was actually misdiagnosed for, by, for about five to seven years with mood swings and which the doctors labeled as bipolar disorder or just major depression because she was very upset all the time. And it, it, it did take, you know, that five to seven year, which is average for rare to be diagnosed with a rare disease for us to understand what she was going through. And you mentioned kind of the Korea piece of Huntington's disease. And, and the re it was actually, you're right. It, was, it used to be called Huntington's Korea because they only looked at the motor symptoms and they, the Korea is like these wobbly movements, the slurred speech, kind of the, the twitching, yeah. constantly moving the kind of like, you know, when you're, you're a little buzzed at the bar, right. Or you're, it's like these drunk like movements, but then they, they realized that it wasn't just these motor symptoms. That there was this, cognitive aspect of it where you know it was tough to concentrate um you know a lot tough to multitask concentration wasn't the best and then there's a psychiatric component or what they call like behavioral right that was kind of where the bipolar disorder mood swings came in lack of motivation and energy really to do much and so i learned about all this when i was 15 years old we actually learned about it when my mom was, we, we decided to bring my mom to a mental facility to get a bunch of tests and evaluations done. And that was very tough to, to do, to bring a loved one to a facility because, you know, we didn't have any other options. We didn't know what was going on. And once we found that out, that's what year was, I, what year was that in? Man, I, I'm aging myself now. No, <laughs> it was 2005. Um, okay, all right. So it was actually 15 years, about 15 years ago. Um, I, you know, I just turned the big 3-0. But when you grow up in a family impacted by a health condition, you tend to grow up a lot faster than your peers. I had to take on a lot more responsibility at home and take my mom out to errands. But most importantly, I was I was in in denial for for quite some time because. I didn't want to live with this new normal. I was embarrassed out in public with my mom because of those stairs or people viewing her differently. I was embarrassed to have people over. And it wasn't until I went to college that realizing that Huntington's disease is a, is a genetic disease. 
which means that I had a 50, 50 chance of inheriting it and ending up like my mom one day. And so at the age of 20, I decided to go through genetic testing. And that's when I learned that I tested positive for this disease and may end up like my mom one day. And that's, you know, really changed my life and my perspective on a lot of things because although I didn't have the disease at that point, I was preparing for what life was going to be like with a rare disease. And right. when you watch your parent slowly get worse and worse where they lose their independency to do anything. And then you say, wow, that could be me one day. It's, it's pretty scary. Right. And it's right. challenging to kind of see that yourself in your parents shoes or your loved one's shoes to say, okay, that, that could be my life one day. And, and that's when I was trying to say, okay, well, I can either not do anything about it or I could get more involved in the community by raising awareness and sharing my story to help others know that they aren't alone in their journey. Yeah. Do you, I forget, do you have siblings at all? I do. I do. I have an older sister and, you know, I, I always mention this and, you know, she doesn't, she hasn't killed me at this point yet, but she, you know, she's still, <laughs> she's still at risk. And the big thing is, is a lot of people in my shoot or that I've talked to about it, they're like, oh yeah, I would test right away. Yeah, of course I would test. But when you see your parent, again, go through that, it's, it's a lot different, right? And your mentality is like, wow, do I really need to know right now? Yeah. I, they actually, there's, I think some data that says only about, I think 10 to 20% of people who know actually go through genetic testing because they say, okay, what am I going to do with this information? But then there's others like, like myself who says, okay, well, I want to know what my future holds and I want to know what I can do about it to help make a difference. Yeah. So I, I, I so I, I have a lot of experience with Huntington's and I actually did not know because uh, my experience goes back 15 years uh, and gone after that or about uh, at least 10 to 15. So my dad's girlfriend was misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And back then it was called Huntington's Korea. So mm -hmm. she was misdiagnosed. And mis mis hey, Woody, can you not? <laughs> <laughs> he literally just pulled out everything. Uh, probably because he was going through mom's heap of stuff under my table. Anyways, um, with that said, do I have anything working? Yeah, we're good. All right. Um, good, so, good. <laughs> so he, uh, so he met this woman at an MS society meeting. And when he met her at the MS society meeting, they started dating and they just knew something was different. And finally she got alternative testing. And when she got the alternative testing year after years went by and then they, and it was just very different than multiple sclerosis. We knew something was up and it, that's when he learned that she had at the time Huntington's Korea, which, so when did it make the switch to being Huntington's disease? Great question, man. I, I don't know. I mean, I just, cause I, you know, when you Google anything, right. You, that's what you kind of end up seeing. You'll see, Oh, Korea. Right. But I think, you know, over time with technology and advancements and just research, they said, okay, it's not just the Korea piece. There's um, more to that disease. Um, yeah. and, and what's interesting um, you know, just looking at a few of these comments is, uh, you know, I wish with these genetic conditions, right. Uh, there's different types there's, and I won't get too sciencey, but like there's autosomal dominant and then recessive when it's dominant, it means that you have a 50, 50 chance of inheriting it. And I actually learned in biology class junior in high school, I was like, Oh, I'm in the clear dad's dominant. It's not how it works. Right. It, one parent has Huntington's disease or, you know, a, a similar type of disease it means that you have a 50 50 chance of getting it. And once you go and get your blood drawn and test positive, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get it unless there's an effective treatment or cure. Right. And that's the goal, right? That's the goal is to find a way to slow things down um, and try to, you know, bring, bring change that way as well. Yeah. So I, I saw a couple of those comments as well. Uh, you've got the, you may not inherit the traits, uh, but once, once you get tested, it's, pretty much uh well it's based off of a number system can you explain the number system to people if you don't mind do you do you, you know it like the 30 to 30 you know i'm sure you know yeah it. yeah 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 no i do i do it's, and it's it's a good thing so you know breaking down science right with with chromosomes you get you know you get half from your mom half from your your dad and how it works is if people remember like how those letters where you have c a g t and you'd have to you know, figure out, you know, perhaps match them up and, and whatnot. And so how it works is that there's a mutation 
And when the CAG, you know, letters repeat too long, that means that you get Huntington's disease. And so the higher that CAG repeat is, the more progressive it tends to be. Uh, the average is about 40 to 44. I, I think, and I could be totally wrong, but I want to say 36 to 39, you can still get it. And then like under 28, 29, and things have con constantly changed. So that's yeah. why. I'm, but I think like under 29, 28, you're kind of normal. And, and, then and that's, it's yeah. fascinating that there is, so you've got the numbers that are like, you are going to get it at a certain age. You've got the numbers like you're going to get it sooner than later, which to me is a, it's such a mind boggling thing to be able to, to have to see your parent go through it and then have essentially that exact, you know, you have a general idea when your ticket is punched. I, what I can't imagine is to be the people that are in the numbers that you don't know. And is that, I think, is that where you said your sister is? She's not sure she didn't actually get tested. But she hasn't got tested, right? And, okay. and I think that's the thing is a lot of people may not get tested until either a they're like hey i want to have kids and i want to make sure my kids are okay and that's a whole another story right it's personal choice I, I i say it's a personal choice right genetic testing is very personal depending on what your situation is um others are saying hey i don't want to i don't want to know because i that's scary and i don't want i saw what it did to my dad or my sister yeah. or my brother or my father whoever and i just don't want to know um but what's interesting with genetics is like you know, there's the people that are going to get it. And then there's also like a juvenile version of it, which means it can impact kids uh, who can you know get it a lot faster. And then there's also like people who don't who test negative, but there's still a chance that their kid could get it. It's still at risk, like 25 percent chance. Yeah, it gets just very complicated, but it's it's tough and it's, it's tough just to like, you know, so. My mom battled it for 17 years. Um, the last few years, she was at a nursing facility. And, you know, just thinking about today's world, like she hated being alone. We, we always went to visit her. She was on the fifth floor. It's not like I could go to the window and just say, hey. Yeah. And so, you know, it's kind of a blessing in disguise of like what life would be like if she was still here during this pandemic. Would I be able to see her? Would we be able to even see her? Would we have to stay there? What that would look like? But you know, she passed away about five years ago. And I always say she's, you know, she's no longer suffering. She's at peace. But now it's like you said, Anthony, it's like, I have to now kind of prepare. Um, and I have to kind of race against time. And that's, that's why I say, even though I'm 30, I feel a lot older because I went through so much just life <laughs> challenges. Yeah, you have to. And yeah. I, I have a question and I'm going to ask you a question because it's based off of my personal experience. So and, and my very mine's different with MS. It's dr drastically different. If you guys don't know what Huntington's Korea is, it's it's a very different illness, and it's 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 a tough one. It's um it's it's a it is definitely something that's difficult. Um, it's difficult to see across the board. And I and you brought up one story, and I'll bring it up with my dad. You, you people think you know they're drunk or whatever it might be. So as a kid, I went with him being him having MS. We went to Six Flags, and we ended up getting kicked out of Six Flags because they thought my dad was too drunk to be there when in fact he actually was just having a rough day with his MS and it I became a huge deal in this day and age. It would be all over the news. It would be, you know, people would have taken their cell phones out and like, you know, videotaped it. And we probably would own half of six flags. But at the time they offered us, I think a free season pass. I can't even remember, but, um, but it is that there's an embarrassment level for a kid at the same time, you grow up very quickly and that embarrassment goes away and then it's a level of self-responsibility. So you do, you do, you, you go from an embarrassment level to growing up. Now, I do think it's different with hunting kids. And I, I say this because you have to choose one of two things. You either be that kid or you understand the genetics behind it and you become angry and people choose to be angry. So my dad's girlfriend's kids I don't know how they ended up. I have no idea what what ha what went 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 on with them. But when they were kids, they were rotten. Like they were bad kids. And I, you know, you can't you can't blame them because they were for them it was a crapshoot. They hadn't had the um, they didn't have the genetic testing. They were so young, and there's three kids, and they're looking at each other, and they know that at least one of them is going to have it, if not two. The chances are very slim that all three would get out. And then there's also the thing that they probably can't have kids without going through a lot, which they actually have that now, that ability to 
make sure that the right genes are going through all the genetic stuff, but which costs over a hundred thousand dollars. It's absolutely insane if you really want to get that done. So I have a question when you were growing up, what kind of, were you a good kid or did you, did you struggle? Did you battle that? Man, I mean, I guess it depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> yeah. I think if you ask like some of my friends or friends' parents, right? But like when I went home, it was kind of like I was so angry at the world. And I, I was I was an angry kid. I mean, people today might have said, oh, you seem fine. But it was because I just didn't know what how to deal with it. I didn't know how to accept it. I was kind of going through like grief and loss because I was losing out on memories with my mom. I was losing out on that childhood experience or that teenage experience with your your family and eventually losing out, right? If I get married one day and not having that mother-son dance, right? I mean, there's so many things that I had to accept now as a part of my life. And yeah, I was, I was very angry and I didn't know how to deal with it. So I just like, we just, always get into arguments, not realizing the implications of the disease until I went to college and knowing I was at risk. And that's when I was like, okay, I want to do something about it. I want to raise some money, raise some awareness and put together like a uh, through and through basketball charity event with a good friend of mine, just to help kind of spread the word about it. And, you know, from there, it's just kind of continuing to share my story and knowing that it can help others know that they aren't alone because I, I felt like I was by myself, right? I felt like I had my friends, I had my family, but no one truly could relate to what I was going through and no one, you know, could just understand what it was like to be a young person who is at risk or eventually tested positive for a disease without a cure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's, so what age did you finally start going, all right, I want to do something about this and set, and transitioning from the anger. And honestly, I, I, again, I, I, I get, I, I don't know. I, it would, it would take something very special for a kid to just be like, wow, I know what, I know what could be in front of me. I see it and just be natural. I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible. I really don't. I don't know. If I don't, uh, but there is that point where it changes and, and you've actually given me hope that her kids possibly changed as well. Um, God, they were, they were evil. Um, they were, and, and I, but you get it. You see, like, they didn't want to visit their mom when she got sick. They didn't want, like it, it's looking in a very difficult mirror and they were very young at the time. So I don't think they had, I don't think they had the ability of going, I don't think they had the sensibility that, a, you know, late teenage or adult style brain would have to the importance of it. Um, so what let's go, I just want to, let's make it basic what kind of message do you pass on to people in terms of when you started making the switch over of saying, I want to do something about this? I think, uh, you know, there's definitely some life altering experiences. One, of course, with just knowing I tested positive, knowing that I had a, a choice to make, right. And we all have choices each day to make of, I can either do, you know, that, you know, go down this path or this other path. And I decided I wanted to make a difference by sharing my story and really opening up about what it was like being a young adult, living with a rare disease and what it meant to me to help out others. And it, it's interesting. I go back to, I think I was about, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I don't remember the story too much, but my, my aunt does. And her and I were going, uh, to help out like it was during i think the holidays it was called uh christmas in the city i think and it was essentially what you know give out gift, gifts to kids who were in need of it and i told her i said one day i want to help people and it's interesting to see that kind of come full circle but you know i realized just that each person has a story to share it's just a matter of how you share it in your platform and over time i started sharing my story and having these different opportunities to tell people, hey, you're not alone in this because I went through that. I understand that the difficulties of feeling isolated, feeling like no one understands what you're going through. And it was through my you know, TEDx talk that I was able to do actually in my hometown where I said, wow, this is such a powerful thing. Storytelling is so powerful that it can help inspire others to say, hey, I'm not alone in this or hey, what can I do now to better my life? And I think the big message is you know, when you even think about, right, 
COVID, there's a lot of unknowns with it, right? And same th thing with Huntington's disease, with genetic testing. There's a lot of unknowns. There's still a lot of unknowns. But what I've learned is that I need to be able to wait today because if I try to plan so far ahead, I'm going to lose out on the moment. I'm going to lose out on just enjoying life day by day. I think that's the big thing that I always try to stress to people that, Yes, it's, it's a lot easier said than done not to plan. Uh, I am a planner, which is probably why I went through genetic testing, but I'm starting to learn the importance of, you know, taking a step back and just appreciating the little things in life, right? You know, taking time each day for myself, whether it's going on a run or a walk or journaling or blogging, it's time for me to just sit back, reflect, and kind of, I guess, get your, your zen on. And I think that's what's, what's important, right? You know, we're dealing with just a crazy 2020. And I think that's what sometimes we forget in life is, yes, this is a tough year. Yes, a lot of things went down, but how can we make sure that we take time for ourselves to, um, you know, take care of ourselves, self-care, right? Mental health, yeah. and just really enjoy what we have today versus saying, oh, I wish I had this, right? Versus, oh, I appreciate I have a roof over my head, that I have clothes, that I have a, a job during, you know, during everything or whatever that might be. Yeah. I think that's universal too. And I, being somebody that has dealt with, um, different, just j with, with my dad and knowing that there was a slightly elevated chance that I could get multiple sclerosis. It wasn't, it wasn't as genetic and the way they look at it is a little bit different. Um, but whether you are, it, it really doesn't matter exactly how old, uh, you are, we start looking at age in a different way. We start looking at what we possibly um, could, what we actually, we, we look at, we look at time as being very, very short. And you start like, even me at 37 years or 38 years old. Now there's days where I'm like, oh my God, time is just passing so incredibly fast. And then you are able to give a message to people like time really is passing fast. So you better enjoy the life that you have in front of you and the moments you have in front of you. Like, I, I just think that's the overriding message with Jeff Marconette, with you, when you talk, every, make every second count and actually be able to live in, live in the moment and actually take some time for yourself. Take that self care. Um, what kind of initiatives do you have going on? What kind of initiatives do you work on uh, in terms of you personally? I mean, one of the biggest ones is last year, actually, I, I, uh, helped put together a nonprofit called Our Odyssey. Um, ironic, you know, Odyssey, right? It's a journey and it's not my journey. It's not yours. It's ours. And the mission of Our Odyssey is to connect young adults impacted by a rare chronic condition to social emotional support and really provide them that sense of belonging, that sense of community that I wish I had growing up. And so it's, it's for young adults. Um, you know, our target age range is 18 to 35, but these are the kind of the, the people, the, the game changers or the change makers who I believe in are going to make a difference in the community and are, are the leaders of tomorrow. But those are the people who kind of inspire me because one, it makes me realize, okay, I'm not alone. Two, knowing that if I have a tough day, okay, I'm not the one having a tough day, but I also have my support system. I know where I need to go for my support. And then just understanding that it's an unmet need of just providing this year round service to young adults uh, in the rare and chronic community. So that's like a big initiative of mine besides, you know, doing some public speaking. And then, you know, I, I try to, I'm also doing uh, consulting, uh, patient advocacy consulting for uh, biotech companies, um, small pharmaceutical companies. And it's really to bring in the patient voice earlier in uh, clinical research and really understand what their the patient's needs are um, to help try to develop uh, treatments or, or cures for some of these rare or ultra rare diseases. So what are, what do you think the, the outlook is in terms of Huntington's and the future? What have, I mean, you're a little bit more involved in it. Is it something that is getting enough funding in order to actually possibly make a change, make a dent, um, or is it something that is, is going to, it'll have to be treatment based. What are your thoughts? Well, regarding Huntington's disease, what's, what's exciting is there's been a lot of research, I would say, 
when I first learned about it 15 years ago, there's probably one company working on it. There's over like 20 to 25 companies now working in, in it, trying to find a way to slow it down or reverse it or, or do something to help you know, improve quality of life. Cause that's the big goal, right? Is we're just trying to improve quality of life, right? Is it helping with those motor symptoms, right? Or is it helping with the that behavior aspect or the cognitive piece, or is it helping with all of them? And so it's, it's very exciting, but I also know it's a process and we have to be patient. It's, you know, they say that it takes about 10 to 15 years to develop a drug, which is a long time. Um, that's the average, right? Some are earlier, some are later, but I think it starts and ends with bringing in that patient perspective. If we right. can understand, you know, their needs and understand what it means to participate in research, then we have a better chance of trying to find something that's going to work. So I am very optimistic. I am very positive about it, but I'm also realistic, right? Knowing that right now in this today, right? Living today, there isn't anything. Right. But what can I do is I can continue to share my story to help others know, you know, the impact Huntington's disease had on me and has on other people. Also understand that you know, each of our voices do matter, right? You know, by sharing your story, you never know who's going to listen and say, wow, I, I didn't know that. Or, hey, I want to learn more. Or, hey, I want to help, right? I want to help give back. I want to get more involved. And that's kind of the, the hope right there is, you know, I'm here to help, but I'm also here to listen to others who want to help too. Yeah. And there, it's interesting. I, w right when we met and it was through just a, a kind of a random, like check-in phone call, kind of see what it was through LinkedIn. Uh, and then I was like, right, once I hear the word Huntington's, it's, it's odd. It's not just my father's, my father's girlfriend. It was, I don't know if a lot of people in the chat have uh, the comments have ties to Huntington's, but it wasn't just her. It was uh, a friend of my mom's. It was um, a girl that I knew's best friend, uh, her whole family. Like I have one, two, three, four. I have four or five direct ties to Huntington's and adding you in that whole mix as well. So I'm always very fascinated because I feel like it is something around me, which makes me always feel like God is telling me to, you know, make sure that this is something to have passion around. And I know that would make my dad incredibly happy because he would look at MS and go, and then he would talk about, you know, that the, his girlfriend that had Huntington's Korea was the love of his life. And it, and, and again, much like a, a son to a mom. And when you actually get over the anger and frustration of, a, of an illness, it gives such purpose to take care of somebody like that. And it gave him immense purpose to this day. Uh, his favorite movie was The Notebook. And when she passed away, he wanted to be there on her bed. Like that was his thing. He wanted to pass away with her. It didn't happen. It happened a couple of years after, but he just had this immense love that he had never had. And he even said, I have a documentary that I did for my senior thesis in college and I'll put it up. Uh, I'll share it. It's on my, it's on my personal YouTube page, but I'll share it on the Be The Change page and don't make fun of my hair. I was 20. I had this big curly, whatever, but, um, but it was very interesting because he talked and he's in, he'd been married way too many times by dad, but he was very clear that that was the love of his life. And she, she was everything to him. And it was the first time he said, it was the first time that he really had to take care of somebody besides himself. Mm -hmm. And there is power in illness. There's power in disease. There's power in tragedy and there's power to come out of it and realize who you are. And of course we, we pray and we, we hope and we, look to science and we look to different things to, so that there is these illnesses can be gone. We've done so many amazing things. Uh, and we, we somehow have these little things slip through the cracks that we should be able to fix. You would think, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And I mean, I would imagine that most people in this chat, whether they know it or not, know someone with either a rare or a chronic condition, right? Chronic conditions are arthritis, diabetes, endometriosis, right? Or these rare diseases like Huntington's disease, MS, Parkinson's. And so it's realizing that, right? Is that there's, it's such a small world, right? There's, of course, it's the odds probably weren't in our favor to connect. And you say, oh, actually I know what hunting, right? A lot of people, oh yeah, no, actually I've heard of it. And I say, yeah. do you actually know what it is? And they're like, oh no, I actually know what it is. Yeah. And, you know, to see also my dad, who of course, great role model to me, being a caregiver to my mom throughout the whole thing, right? That's, you know, to me, it's remarkable because I want someone, you know, if it gets to that stage or just in general, right, to that we can support each other through, 
sickness and in health, right? That's the whole saying and, and whatnot. And, you know, I will say here's another sign for you, Anthony, is that yesterday actually marked my parents' anniversary. So what are the odds that we were supposed to do this, at, what, two weeks ago? And we're doing it this week. And, you know, yesterday marked their anniversary and whatnot. And so I'm a big believer in sign. I'm a spiritual person. Um, so it's it's uh, cool just to be here and, and speak with you. And, you know, I really like the Kelly's comment that she mentioned about kind of how you have to kind of allow yourself to feel those emotions, right? Yeah. I mean, when you, um, when you're experiencing these feelings, what I used to do is that I got to be strong for others, right? Especially being a, a guy, right? Guys don't really share, tend to share their feelings, right? And I learned that it's okay to share them. And it's okay to be vulnerable. And that's something I, I continue to just address because, I think sometimes when you try to boil it up, it ends up coming out the wrong way or you just get too frustrated and it all comes out at once versus just letting you accept it and then try to figure out those next steps. Yeah. Um, what, uh, so I have, I actually, if you guys want to ask a couple questions, we've got about 10 minutes left and then I want to, I've already put them in the comments, but I want to actually throw them up there again. Some of the sites, your TEDx talk, as well as your, uh, your, the Odyssey website. Mm -hmm. um what is do you know anything about CRISPR what is CRISPR yeah so cr CRISPR has been a term that's been thrown around for for quite some time and it's it's essentially gene editing so there's like this big it's a big it's a it can be kind of controversial to be honest um only because it's essentially it could work but they've been taught you know CRISPR has been talked about for quite some time you have to make sure that's ethical right it's going getting in the right hands because if you think about it right if one person say, Hey, I'm going to pay you X amount of money. I want my kid to be six, eight and blue eyes. Right. It, it just, it, we, we don't want it to get to that stage yeah. where it's getting in. Like people are just kind of building their, their kids versus just having it whatever way they want to. Um, right. It's also just tricky. It's just research, right? You want to be able to edit the genes, but you also want to make sure that it doesn't impact other aspects of your body. Right. If you, it's kind of like, I always think of those movies where you have to like cut the wire, right? And if you cut the wrong wire, you just blow up. Um, it's, it's somewhat similar to that, right? You, you want to make sure that you're doing it the right way and that it's safe and effective. He's not going to get Huntington's, but he might have 13 elbows. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, they actually said at one point, uh, this was like a research study. It was like, oh, if you like completely remove it, then you actually might be at higher risk for like cancer or something. And I'm like, you know, you can't win. You can't win. Exactly. So it's, it is something though that's been, you know, talked about, I will say, but it's, it's just, it can be kind of controversial compared to some of the other uh, opportunities out there that are on the horizon. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, like, because they talk about, well, you're more susceptible to cancer. We don't know. I mean, the body, the, the genome map in a body is endless and the little things that you change, they might be there for a reason. Like the way that I would say, looking at this is, for the most part, we are meant to be who we are. Mm -hmm. If you look at that from a spiritual level, from whatever level, uh, God level. So you're put on this planet with this potential illness and potential disease and a ticking time clock. But you have, you know this, you've chosen to know this, and you have the ability to maximize every bit of the time you have, including the time that you have hundreds. Of, if, if, if we get there, hopefully, hopefully we won't. Whereas maybe cancer could have taken you as a kid. Cancer could have, or, or you would just be an, an everyday Joe. You would be a nine to five guy and not make an impact on the world. And you live to 65 and you end up getting cancer then, or you end up being completely healthy. The whole concept behind it is, is you, you were meant to have a certain thing. And you look at it as the body is, you can look at it as in a spiritual level that the body was meant to do something to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I referenced the biggest little farm all the time. It's this movie that shows like they were like, they thought certain things were pests. So you think that your, your genes are the pests. They're terrible. We got to kill these pests, but they're actually there to protect you from something else. That's a stretch when it comes to Huntington's, but the concept, oh, yeah. the, the, the overriding concept is still there. There is a purpose behind all levels of tragedy. And as long as you look at it as that and the ability that you can come out of it. So, and I think that's, that's the message that that's the message I get from you without, I don't even know if that's what you mean, but that's the message I get is we have a purpose. We have to take 
the the bad things in our life and make sure we're using that to, to capitalize on being able to create that change we have the ability to do in the world around us. So. Yeah, and, and most importantly, find what makes you happy. I mean, you can work that nine to five job and not feel fulfilled or you know take risks and, and do something that you're passionate about and really help make a difference. I mean, that's exactly what I did was I said, you know what, I'm gonna do something I enjoy doing and I wanna help, I like to help people. I like to connect people to resource and support, but it's also, it's like you said, it's finding your purpose. And I, I don't look back and say I, I regrets. I don't have any of that. It's more of just trying to enjoy today and not look too far ahead. But you know, it, it is, in my mind, right. To, to think, okay, how many more years do I have? Um, it's tough to really say, right. I could have 15 years. I could have 20 years. I could have forever if, if there is an effective treatment, but if I plan so far ahead, I'm going to lose out on what I can do today to make a difference. Exactly. So, um, it, this is Maria about, are you still, you still live in Boston, right, Seth? I do. Yeah. 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 She's in Mass. I think she's still. If she's in Massachusetts, I, I think she moved up there. She's awesome. Uh, her and I met very similar to you. She's probably going to be on the show soon as well. She's a, she comes up the tallest runner. She had sepsis. She was just getting into running, uh, and she ended up having to lose her toes. And then she was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to run a half marathon. And she has to go through all these different things. You guys should hook up if you guys are both local. I believe Plainville. Do you know where Plainville is? Yes, yes, I do. I I am in Cambridge. So nice. I, I'm in the city. She's outside of, of the city. Well, you guys, I, I want to make sure you guys hook up with each other. Both of you guys have very similar messages. Uh, she's got a cool book as well. So make sure you guys hook up. But it's interesting you say park. She said Parkinson's. So the way that I would always describe this, because a lot of people don't know what Huntington's is, I used to describe it as a mix of Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and Alzheimer's kind of thrown into one uh, little soup uh, of, of not funnery. Um, but again, being able to come out of it with a level of po like just an, an immense level of positivity and the way that I view you, Seth, is in, I'm in awe of, of, of that ability to overcome the mental aspect and be able to create change. And that's amazing. So I cannot give you any of us, I can't give you any more uh, props for what you do. And, and your message is great, which I want to put that back up. If you guys scroll up in the, um, if you guys scroll up in the uh, box a little bit, I'll show it there, but it's it's up there in the comments. Go to his TED talk. It was about it was only about 15 minutes long, wasn't it? Yeah, if it, you know it went it goes by so fast. They actually say for for a talk for a TEDx talk or for a TED talk, they say it shouldn't be more than 18 minutes because you then end up kind of losing your audience. And I was pra I probably practiced like 50 to 100 times. And what I learned about just speaking in general, it's it's not a you know, you can memorize it, but they really say memorize your outline of your story because they say yeah. no one knows your story better than you. So you just have to talk about it. You, you don't need to say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that because most of the people aren't going to know unless you practice in front of them. And then you can later say, oh, yeah, I screwed up there. I remember that. But it, it yeah, it's about, I think, 13 minutes. Uh, it was in front of 800 people and I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. But the thing that happened was I was so pumped because I finally got to like rock like a, what I call like the boy band mic, you know, the Britney Spears mic, whatever. And I was the only one, I kid you not, that my mic did not work. Um, it, it didn't work. I was the third person up, ready to go. Mic doesn't work. They give me a handheld mic. But I felt like that was like a sign for to say, okay, like you broke the ice, here you go. like nothing worse can happen now. So yeah. it, it was a, it was, it was interesting, but you'll notice and people, you know, if you go back to it, you'll notice, Oh, why does he have like a handheld mic and like a regular mic? Last minute. They're like, here, just take this. What's funny is I am. So I, I've done work with those as well. I talk a lot with my hands. If you can't tell, uh, I actually like, uh, handhelds better. It's like this weird MC thing. Like, and I don't know if it's a crutch or whatever it might be, but I was used to it for events. So when I had to switch to this, I felt very naked. I'm like, Oh, this is weird. Like, I feel like I need something there. So I actually prefer a handheld. Uh, but I can, uh, yeah, the, the, the headphones are, they are pretty cool when you actually get to use those. I, I will. It say. is, it is. And I will say with a, one, one last kind of story, which is interesting is, you know, Rhonda brought up about anyone can get 
hit by a bus tomorrow. And what's interesting is when I was living out in Chicago, I went to, I was going to the gym and started talking to someone there. And they're like, yeah, I'm just so glad I could work, uh, work out again. I was like, Oh, what happened? They go oh, like, I got hit by a car. And like, you know, you know, you hear the saying, Oh, you can get hit by a bus or a car, but you never actually meet someone. And so when I was like, wow, okay. Like she just appreciates being able to work out. Right. And it just kind of, again, it reminds you of that idea of just enjoying what you have today and just appreciating it. And, you know, I like to surround myself with just positive people, positive energy. And that's kind of the way to go in, the, in this world is just kind of be good to other people. And that's hopefully people will be good back to you. Yeah. It's, it's, um, kindness, kindness is goes much further than people realize. Uh, and yes, Sarah, it's distance between me and the audience. I get it. I get it. It's a crutch. I get it. <laughs> um, and then Connie said the fast, the fact that you make yourself available, uh, to direct and support others, such cur- uh, encourages a beautiful thing, uh, you do with your life. So thank you. Gratefulness is a virtue. Um, yeah. And I think I want to make sure I throw up your, our odyssey page one more time. Um, is there any initiatives that people can help you with, with what you're doing? Is there anything, do you have a call to action for people where if you go to the site, is there donations or what, what project do you have that you're working on with people that people can help you out with? Man, I mean, just life in general. No, I, I, I honestly just love having conversations with people and just learning about their journey and being able to help them along their kind of life path. So if they're interested in, in kind of connecting they could go to our odyssey.org or they can go to my uh, other web. They can follow me on Instagram or, or Twitter at the, the link. I've always wanted to do this. Yeah, there you go. Bam. Um, they could reach out to me that way or go to my personal website, just sethrotberg.com. Um, but, you know, regarding our odyssey, if they, if they want to help make a donation, you know, they can donate there. Um, if they're interested in learning more, happy to help out. But, you know, I, for me, it's, it's really just, this is just an opportunity, right? To just share a little bit about Huntington's disease, share a little bit about the adversity I faced growing up with my mom and then testing positive and then saying, okay, what do I do now with life? And then from there, you know, using my own story as a platform to help others, that's kind of what I appreciate the most about this. So I just want to say thank you for having me on and being able to, you know, connect and, and kind of share a little bit about myself. Appreciate it, Seth. So I'm going to give everybody one more reminder. we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I'm going to throw this up there. Again, if you want to listen to this, the hashtag uh, be the change.com backslash podcast. Make sure you check that out. Um, we are probably going to do a truth will set you free. I saw Cash just put something up on Streetlights. I don't know what that means. I'm going to go check to see what he's got planned for this evening or whenever that was. Um, and then we've got, obviously, as you know, the election is next week. You'll see a lot of our programming with that. Friday, we'll, of course, have our new show, our quick recap with Rachel Altman, um, everybody's favorite libertarian. So if you guys want to check her out, uh, make sure that'll be on Friday. So share that out there. Share this one out there. Super positive content. I hope that you guys got something out of it. I love the outlook of understanding that life is not always sunshine and rainbows, but we have so much opportunity to do so much with it. And I hope that that's what you guys took from it. And one last reminder, we do have the Patreon set up if you'd like to help us out in any way, shape or form again next week. Trivia. I know Nicole is looking for one of those hats or sweatshirts. I saw that in there. We'll find a way. We'll make it work, Nicole. So again, I, I, I might have to uh, check it out and, and see if I can get a nice hat or, or a sweatshirt or something. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in, man. I'm in. I found out we have these extra ones. So I, I found that out that I have a whole bunch of these in the uh, thing. These will never be available on the website. We'll have different. Oh, muted yourself. Nope. There we go. Yeah. There you go. You got so excited about the about the uh, hat. You're like, oh, I just hit the mute button. Funny uh, elbows. I look like I'm about to rob a bank or something right now. Anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Seth, thank you again. Uh, share this out there, everybody. I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, I want to talk on my class. I think, well, you know what, guys, make sure you connect with Seth. Uh, and 100%, I want to make sure that you and Maria hook up as well. I'll make sure that happens. Carolyn's also from out there. She's an awesome lady as well. 
the more powerful people you guys get together in your area, always a great, great mix, great combination, great way to create change. So thank you guys again, Seth, any final words? You know, I would say just, you know, stay safe out there. Just, you know, get ready to hibernate in the winter if, if you're from <laughs> Massachusetts, <laughs> but in, in all, in all seriousness, you know, that when you do have those tough days, just know that you're not alone in this journey. Know that, you have a support system, reach out to people that you can, you know, rely on. Uh, or, you know, I always say, I, even if I don't know you that well, if I can help, let me know. I'm always willing to, to do what I can to help others. And then just remember that each day is a new day. So, you know, you, it's up to you to make the most of it. Perfect. Be the change you wish to see in the world, everybody. We'll see you for more programming soon. Thanks again for watching. Like, share, etc. Subscribe. Hasta luego. See ya.